What's up everybody, Rob here. So England and France have had a difficult relationship to say the least. There was near constant fighting between the two nations since the Norman conquest of 1066. Peace was attempted on several occasions and none were in a more flamboyant fashion than 1520 when King Henry VIII and King Francois I of France met for a diplomatic treaty, which soon devolved into a royal competition to see which king could host a more extravagant event. This is a very brief look at the field of the cloth of gold. It all started in 1518 with the Treaty of London, in which 25 European states agreed to a non-aggression pact, mostly as a counterweight to potential Ottoman expansion. The main architect of this treaty was none other than Henry VIII's principal counselor, Cardinal Wolsey. In addition to this treaty, there was yet another treaty, signed between England and France, in which Henry's daughter Mary would marry the Dauphin of France, who would later become Francois III, and the city of Tournai would be returned to French control after a hefty payment. To seal this treaty, it would be agreed that the two kings would meet face to face. Now, this was appealing to both Henry VIII, who was aged 29, and the French king, Francois I, who was aged 23, who in their testosterone-fueled sense of grandeur saw an opportunity to outdo each other in sheer extravagance. And once again, the entire affair would be arranged by Cardinal Wolsey, who basically had to have his hand in pretty much everything that Henry VIII did. In order to make the event as neutral as possible, the location was set for Calais, which was an English territory, but the actual specific location would be located very near the French border. The date was originally set for 1519, but there were several delays which actually worried the French considerably, fearing that the English would back out of the treaty. However, after a great deal of diplomatic wrangling, the final date was set for June of 1520. Just to complicate things ever further, Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire decided to pay a little bit of a visit to England just before everybody set out, hoping to influence the English against his French rivals and delay them ever further. The Emperor's efforts were in vain, however, and as late May approached, Henry, his wife Catherine of Aragon, and an absolutely titanic entourage set out for France, making their way across the Channel. While all of this diplomacy was going on, work, however, was well underway. It was agreed that the two monarchs would build their own camps next to one another. Each king was responsible for their respective nation's camp, and they took the opportunity to flaunt their wealth in front of each other in the most extravagant and, quite honestly, fiscally wasteful way possible. On the English side, massive tents and pavilions were erected to accommodate Henry's 3,997 guests, attendants, servants, and other staff members, as well as their 2,078 horses, and in addition to that, 1,175 members of Queen Catherine of Aragon's entourage with their 778 mounts. Henry's personal bodyguard consisted of 200 men wielding halberds and a kitchen staff of over 200 was also involved, all requiring more than 2,800 tents to house. The numbers on the French side were very similar. I don't have those numbers, but you can imagine they were probably just about as absurd. Now, these aren't little tiny tents that would be used, say, for soldiers campaigning in the field or something you can get, say, at a sporting goods store or anything like that. No, but these are massive pavilions. They're just absolutely, they're building-sized tents, and they're made from dyed wool and cloth of gold. And just so you know, cloth of gold is woven fibers with gold filaments woven into the middle of it. It is extremely expensive. There is also something known as cloth of silver, which is the exact same thing. It's just, you know, made with silver instead of gold, but it's not as expensive, so nobody cares. Now, pavilions might be good for the average person, but Henry VIII does not do anything without a sense of drama and a sense of style, so he ordered the construction of a massive palace. Since the region is mostly flat grassland, devoid of timber or other building materials, the wood and brick for the structure had to be imported in. It measured 124 feet by 42 feet and 30 feet tall. Now, of course, the reality is you're not going to be able to build a full palace, so unfortunately for Henry, it was more of a tent than an actual palace. It had a brick base, but was otherwise made from timber frames supporting tapestries that were dyed and painted to resemble actual stone and contained large panels of glass, which was, again, titanically expensive, which offered a clear view to the outside. In addition to these buildings, there was also a temporary chapel built containing gold, silver, velvet, and jeweled furnishings. Nearly life-sized gold-plated statues lined the wall, and the entire structure was attended by more than 35 clergy members. Kitchens were also set up with massive boiling cauldrons, a baking house, and a massive roasting pit for the massive amounts of meat that would be served. During the course of the month-long summit, 3,000 sheep and goats would be eaten, 800 calves and 300 oxen, as well as copious amounts of other animals. 
to wash all of this down, two golden fountains were erected, which constantly flowed with red wine rather than water. With all of these structures in place, it was time for the meeting of the two monarchs. In June of 1520, Henry and Catherine left England for France, and Francois left Paris for the designated meeting spot. On June 7th, their entourages met and stood off from one another like two opposing armies waiting for battle. Everyone was decked out in their finest clothing covered in cloth of gold. There was actually so much cloth of gold that it gave name to the event. Everything was studded with jewels and pearls and other precious materials. At a prearranged time, the English and the French both fired cannons simultaneously as a signal. At this signal, Henry and Francois then rode towards each other and met in the middle of the field between their two opposing entourages. The two men then embraced one another on horseback before dismounting and entering one of the pavilions for a private meeting with Cardinal Wolsey and the Admiral of France. Thus, the festivities commenced. On Sunday, June 10th, Henry dined in late morning with the ladies of the French court, including, and I'm going to mispronounce this, Queen Claudette of Valois, as well as Francois' mother, Louise of Savoy. Also there were their attendants, which may have included, in a bit of historical irony, none other than Anne Boleyn, because, you know, history has a weird sense of humor like that. Likewise, later that day, King Francois dined with Queen Catherine and the ladies of the English court, and according to the records, kissed all of them except those that were too old or too ugly, because, you know, chivalry. The next day, the tilt yards opened up, leading to near-endless jousting competitions, though it would be agreed that the two kings would not face one another lest they embarrass each other. There would be other competitions as well, including archery competitions, axe throwing, wrestling, and many other sports. Now, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say that there were probably drinking competitions as well. Now, there's absolutely zero ev evidence for this in any sort of historical record. But basically, you got a bunch of very young, like, basically the attendants were a who's who of all the nobles of France and England. Where you got, like, basically a lot of very young, very testosterone-fueled people who were trying to impress one another. And there were giant golden fountains flowing with red wine. I find it very hard to believe that there weren't some drinking competitions going on here. Again, that's just my personal take on this. Just throwing that out there. Make of that whatever you will. But yeah, I'm pretty sure there were some drinking contests. Throughout all of this, the two kings also continually sent gifts to one another. Jewels, clothing, and other finery exchanged hands as thousands of French and English nobles and their attendants dined and competed. Chivalry and courtesy were the name of the game during this month-long diplomatic process, which incidentally included very little in the way of diplomacy. But even courtesy turned into a competition. At one particular mass that was attended by both Francois and Henry, it turned into a bit of a standoff as to who was more courteous to the other. Now, a little bit of an explanation here. At, at some point in the mass, it was tradition that the highest ranking person in the room at the time would kiss the gospel. The priest that was there thought this would be Francois, since he was in fact a French priest, so he went over to his king and presented the gospel for Francois to kiss. But Francois, trying to be the paragon of chivalry, refused and instead turned over to uh, Henry. And then Henry said, no, no, really, it's not me, it's you. This is your priest, this is, you know, your place. You know, you're, you're much more higher rank than I am. See, look how courteous I am. And then Francois said, no, no, I insist you. No, I insist you. And it went back and forth and back and forth for several minutes. I'm sure there was a copious amount of eye rolling going on at that point. Um, exactly who ended up kissing the gospel, I really have no idea, but you know, I just think that's a funny story. Also, at another mess, someone who may or may not have done this deliberately set off a firework which went off in the shape of a dragon, which absolutely terrified the inhabitants of the local town of Gisne. Gisnes? that on the screen. Anyway, you absolutely terrified those people out, but I'm sure everybody there thought it was absolutely hilarious. The event was capped off with an archery competition between Henry and Francois, which Henry won because, you know, the English and their longbows, well, that's kind of their thing. Well, as the two monarchs were well into their wine later on, Henry then challenged Francois to a wrestling match. Now, Francois was sort of hesitant to do this. Now, he didn't want to risk it. You know, he didn't want to, you know, there was actually a pretty good vibe between these two guys, and he really did not want to, uh, you know, to ruin anything. But Henry, being Henry, he always gets his way, and he kept pestering Francois until Francois finally agreed. Now, both men were actually very accomplished wrestlers, which was a necessity in medieval combat, particularly Henry, who was well over six feet tall and was a very large, powerfully built individual. Now, this is before he uh, took it. Well, he took a jousting in uh, injury later on in his life, which led to him becoming the fat guy that we all know and love. 
But um, at this time, he was actually very athletic and very muscular. So he was actually a very strong, powerfully built individual, and Francois was no slouch himself. Likewise, wrestling was also a sport of the common folk, since the objective in this particular type of wrestling was to get your opponent to the ground. Basically, you just knock him to the ground. It's not a submission or a pin or anything like that, which is actually much safer than something, say, boxing, which... Um, Wrestling was also a very popular sport among the common folk, since the objective was to knock your opponent to the ground. This really wasn't anything about submissions or pins or anything like that. It's basically you have two fighters, they're in a standing position, and they have to knock their opponent to the ground. This is actually much safer than another type of combat sport, say boxing, which was much riskier and had longer lasting side effects. The peasantry also needed to be ready for work the next day, which could be difficult after suffering concussions or broken bones. The result of being bludgeoned repeatedly or, in fact, bludgeoning somebody repeatedly with your fist. And this is an era where medical technology was, let's just face it, all but non-existent. So a broken bone pretty much means you're losing that limb. And honestly, boxing more often than not and other striking arts were simply not worth it. Wrestling, however, was a much, much safer alternative. So the two monarchs met in a grassy field nearby one of their pavilions. And although Henry was much larger and older and therefore more experienced, Francois somehow managed to get Henry to the ground with a move called the Breton Trip. Now, I'm not exactly sure what a Breton Trip is. Maybe it's a double leg takedown. Maybe it's a single leg. I don't know. Maybe it's like a, um, you know, a hip toss or something like that. I really have no idea what it was. But in any case, the French guy won. And Henry, being Henry, was in a bad mood for the rest of his time there. So, after almost a month of nearly endless festivities... On Sunday, June 24th, the kings finally exchanged final gifts with one another and departed. Francois would return home, but Henry would not actually go back to England. He would actually go on to another meeting with Charles V, which sort of defeated the entire purpose of the Field of Cloth of Gold. Henry V and Francois were, well, rivals of one another, and the English were a major player in their rivalry. Both of them were trying to court English support. And so by meeting with Charles, Henry just pretty much undermined the entire point of the entire meeting with Francois. So what was the ultimate result of this massive diplomatic show? Well, pretty much nothing. I'm just going to be perfectly honest with you. The whole thing was a massive, titanic waste of time and money. But then again, you have to consider that's pretty much what Henry VIII was known for. Massive displays. He was obsessed with the idea of chivalry and, you know, the, the romantic ideals of chivalry, at least. And he wanted to demonstrate that in every way possible. And so he flaunted his massive wealth as, well, as best he could. And as far as that goes, yeah, that was a complete total success. Now, as far as a lasting peace with France, well, not really, no. I do believe that they went in there with uh, the French and the English went there with a genuine desire to have peace between their countries. Uh, you don't marry off your daughter to a person you want to attack later. Uh, by the way, the, um, the arrangement between France, it would later be Francois III and Mary, um, Mary of England, yeah, um, that fell through. But, you know, at least they made the attempt, and I think there was a genuine attempt there. However, due to the realpolitik of the ever-shifting alliances between the various European powers, there was really no hope of a lasting peace. And, you know, the English and the French, they just have a history together, and that just never, that never really went away, at least until the 20th century. In 1522, the English would make a separate treaty with the Holy Roman Empire, the Treaty of Bruges, and the arranged marriage between the Dauphin of France, uh, later be Francis III, and Princess Mary just, you know, fell apart with that. And in 1523, the two nations would be in open war with one another. Furthermore, the French would later ally themselves with the Ottoman Empire, and the Treaty of London, which actually started this whole thing, was actually put in place to counter Ottoman expansion, and the French completely undermined that by allying with the Ottomans. So, yeah, the field of the cloth of gold was ultimately completely pointless. And one final irony. Cardinal Wolsey, the advisor of Henry who put together the entire event, would later on be drawn up for charges of treason. And this was due to his failure to get an annulment for the marriage between Catherine of Aragon and Henry. And Boleyn got involved. There was the split between the Church in Rome and the Church of England, and it was established there. And you, you guys know the story. If you don't know the story, I'm not going to tell you. You should really do some research on your own. You should know it anyway, because it's a pretty famous event. But in any case, one of the charges that were drawn up against him was, and I quote, "...prodigal dispending of the king's treasure, as well as sumptuous building made, only for that use and not to endure." So, yes, that giant fake palace that Henry had built, yeah, that was actually used against Wolsey. There's just no pleasing some people, I guess. 
any case, that is it for the video. Please hit the like and subscribe button. More videos from me coming out whenever I get around to it. And have a good day. Or don't have a good day. Your adults can have any kind of day you want. See you later.